Good evening. I would like to welcome you to the Tuesday, July 26, 2022 Housing and Redevelopment Authority meeting. Uh, first order of business is the roll call. May we have the roll call, please? Coulter. Sorry. Coulter. Present. Hoogheem. Present. Lewis. Present. Martin. Present. Thorson. Here. <laughs> All uh, commissioners are present. There is a quorum. Thank you. Um, our next item is the approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or changes? Madam Chair? Yes, Commissioner Hukim. I would like to make a motion to move items 6 1 and 6 2 ahead of item 4.1. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It's been moved by Commissioner Hukim with a second by Commissioner Coulter to move items 6.1 and 6.2 to uh, before item 4.1. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, motion passes five to one, or five to zero. I'm counting as I'm doing this, five to zero. So we will change the agenda and move 6.1 and 6.2 um, right after our item number three. Um, Item number three, approval of the minutes of July 12th, 2022. Are there any changes or corrections? Yes, Commissioner Coulter. Uh, Madam Chair, I am just making a note that because I was not present for this meeting, I will be abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any changes or corrections from the commissioners who were present? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of July 12th, 2022? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, moved by Commissioner Martin with a second by Commissioner Thorson to approve the July 12th, 2022 HRA board meeting minutes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, the minutes have been approved with three to z four to zero. Thank you. I'm going to have number problems tonight. Um, now we are going to move on to item 6.1, accessory dwelling units, the ADU update. May we have the staff report. Thank you, uh, Chair Lewis. This is Erica Coleman, HRA Administrator. We do have uh, Tom Remler Olson joining us from our planning division. That will provide this update, and he is joining us uh, via WebEx. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. I have a presentation prepared. Um, this will hopefully guide the dis or um, you know just uh, guide some of the discussion that um, I'll be talking about what we've been doing and. Um, also posing some questions because it would be uh, great to get the feedback of the HRA um, as we're, you know, as we're developing this ordinance. It, it, um, it does come before the city council on August 8th, so there is some time <laughs> to make some, some changes as, as long as they're not uh, uh, too hefty. But nonetheless, uh, I'll begin here, full screen. Uh, so, just a, a little bit of background. Uh, 2009, uh, there was an ADU. Or the city passed an ADU ordinance. That uh, ordinance allowed for um, accessory dwelling units on single-family properties, those zoned R1 and RS1. However, uh, the form of those ADUs were um, either attached or within the main home on the property. In 2019. Uh, there was an ordinance update which uh, dealt with the minimum lot size and the size of the accessory dwelling unit or ADU. Um, it's, no, it's notable to, to say that uh, since 2009, only two ADUs have been approved and only one constructed since the original adoption in 2009. So that's part of the motivation uh, with this round of revisions and I'll get to um, what we're uh, hoping to accomplish. Oh, oh boy, okay, I'm sorry, I just uh, stopped sharing my screen. I don't know why that happened. Let's try that again. Okay, um, yes, so 
A little bit more background. Uh, last year, uh, staff did a, a meeting, a joint meeting with the uh, Planning Commission and HRA back in October. If, if um, I'm not sure who was all there, if there's been any turnover in HRA, because I just uh, joined the city back at the end of March of this year, so I'm fairly new. Uh, if that <laughs> gives you some idea of uh, my uh, relative uh, um, newness with this topic, in fact. Uh, so uh, the city council also held a study session in September, uh, February of this year, and um, we also had a Let's Talk Bloomington page. We had a winter, uh, we had a uh, table at the Winners Farmer Farmers Market, and we also did some engagement at Creekside Community Center. Uh, some of the objectives that came out of that meeting, if you recall, back in October of last year, were um, behind the the most recent uh, round of revisions was to increase affordable housing opportunities expand opportunities for aging in place and life cycle housing, creation of rental space um, for additional income. So for those properties that actually wanted to rent the ADU and create new housing units while minimizing uh, negative impacts. Um, this, the, the analysis that we performed and we, uh, that we're now suggesting revisions um, include uh, the ADU definition, which is kind of scattered throughout the city code, but nonetheless, we we found all all the examples within city code and we're just creating some consistency between the uh, definition um, we're now adding detached adus um, so that's the the most significant part of this um, revision is the detached adus um, so as i said right um, at the beginning of this presentation only attached or those units within existing homes are allowed within the city we also touched on parking requirements occupancy and convertibility so yeah, the big one is the detached ADUs. In fact, if you look to the right on this slide, you'll see a, a, a detached ADU behind the main home. And that's kind of the form that's being promoted. Um, I mean, not exactly with this, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't transfer one-to-one -to, -one to, uh, to Bloomington, but nonetheless, it will be a fully separate structure that will have, um, that will meet building code and we'll have all the facilities necessary to be to count as a dwelling unit. Um, I could go into further detail about some of the revisions we've we've made. Um, in fact, um, maybe I'll also talk uh, touch upon the conversations we've been having uh, with um, uh, the um, uh, uh, Faith Jackson and um, in her role in um, managing uh, the. Um, uh, racial equity impact analyses for these types of proposals for the city. And we had a conversation just recently and we touched upon um, some of the impacts of this policy and what and how it'll affect different parts of the city. Um, and it's primarily uh, a consequence of of lot size. So a lot bigger lot sizes are on the west side of the city here. I'm going to pull up a slide because I actually have I prepared um, some uh, graphics that kind of show uh, where um, where ADUs, um, if if passed in the form that we're proposing, where detached ADUs will be eligible to be built, and those lots that will be eligible to, to host them. So this shows where impervious surface is 30% or gra greater. Um, the suggested ordinance will have will allow um, uh, ADUs on properties that comply with impervious surface limits of 35%, however, um, or less. So if they're 30% or greater, they're already at risk of having too much impervious surface coverage on the property. Um, and what's notable is that there does seem to be a, a fairly even uh, distribution of properties across the city. Well, I mean, it, uh, this uh, staff hasn't performed that level of analysis. I suppose it is worth mentioning that it does appear that there is a greater concentration of lots that um, have a higher percentage of impervious surface on the east side. Um, you'll see it uh, just east of 35W. Um, we overlay that uh, those lots over the um, census tracts that have, a, um, and uh, you know this this shows those census tracts that have a, a BIPOC population of a certain percentage, or, uh, you know, a proportion of their population um, identifies as BIPOC. And again, so those 
census tracts that have a, a higher uh, proportion of the BIPOC population um, are concentrated in those uh, census tracts to the east. And that also corresponds with that concentration of, again, just through visual inspection, this hasn't been actually um, analyzed any further than that. But nonetheless, it is noteworthy to take that into consideration. Um, I suppose it's worth bringing up that this, you know, there are there are there are more opportunities on the west side of the city, but that may also give uh, renters an opportunity to live on the west side of the city. Um, so there there might be um, it might address equity concerns in that regard. That it allows greater flexibility where residents, you know, those renters where they can locate in the city. Um, so I'm going to go back to uh, some of the questions that I think are, are worth discussing and that I'd love your input on. Um, is the city interested in playing a role in the promotion and development of ADUs? And if so, uh, what shape would that role take? Um, so those are some questions that um, I'd love your feedback on. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I will open it up to the commissioners. Are there any questions or some comments you'd like to make for, to Mr. Ramler Olson? Yes. Uh, yes, Commissioner Martin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, a quick question here. So I, I noted uh, or I saw uh, in the proposed language here that staff had recommended removing a provision saying the ADUs uh, need to maintain the outward appearance of a single family dwelling. And, and I get how that would be subjective, but I guess is there anything to say somebody couldn't go and uh, get, say, like one of the prefabricated tin sheds that you'd see way up north, drop it down, and as long as it was retrofitted with sanitary and cooking and all the things you'd expect in an ADU, uh, that that would fly? I just there's there's a lot of big tin buildings out there. It seems like would technically work. For uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes, Commissioner. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, the standards, those performance standards that we uh, subject single family homes to uh, would be similar to, or to the ADUs. So it would be, it would have to include comparable materials. They're also considered accessory structures and within uh, code currently, accessory structures have to um, have the outward appearance of the main home in terms of uh, style and building material. So that would also be something that would be imposed upon the um, any proposed detached ADUs um, in the city. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Commissioner Hukim. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, regarding your questions, um, I can't answer obviously for the city council, but as an HRA commissioner, I would say that I do have an interest in the promotion and development of ADUs. Um, I was a part of that conversation with the planning commission and just thought that this was just another creative way for us to create more housing within our city and af make it affordable. Um, I don't know what that role necessarily looks like just because it is so new, um, but I think it's, it's an exciting opportunity in how we can maybe help residents do this, especially I would say, you know, um, residents may, residents in need, people of color, um, our BIPOC community, I think showing support in that could be really good for the city. So I definitely support this. I supported it during the original conversation. Um, to follow up with that though, I do have one question as well. Um, when, we, when you were talking about applications and like only two were approved, do you have an idea of kind of how many if more than two applications the city has kind of gotten on these, um, if that's why this, because I can't remember now if that's why this directed into a new conversation about this, if we had a lot of applications and we just weren't available, uh, we just weren't allowed to approve them, you know, just kind of the interest, I guess. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for that question. The, the history of the applications, um, I'm not too familiar, uh, other than, um, discussing with other staff how many have actually been approved and then how many have actually then uh, resulted in construction. I, um, I'll go based on my most recent experience where, or I mean, just so far my experience with the city, where we do get inquiries from residents um, and you know, we will, we will um, 
discuss with them what the standards are, what are the limitations, what are the difficulties with their particular property with hosting an ADU, or and also provide suggestions for opportunities. We're willing to work with them. It's just that it never gets to the application phase if we don't see a viable path to getting a, uh, an ADU approved. So it is a very new building model where people will come in and ask questions and that's where we can engage them. But we don't need to put them through the application process if uh, there's just there's no way to to get a, um, a an ADU as it's currently um, written in uh, the approved form of an ADU as as it is in uh, city code. So we it doesn't really progress beyond that. Um, I will say that because I've been working on this, I've been having a lot more conversations with residents and telling them that there is. Um, this opportunity for detached ADUs to be allowed that's uh, going to be taken up by the city. So there is there is interest. We do get a lot of calls um, and we get um, emails from residents that are interested in this this building model. Um, and so I, I can only speak to my experience since the end of March. I can also confidently say that other staff have received uh, inquiries about this but um, it's just been limited to the attached form of an ADU or those that could be that that could be um, constructed within the existing walls of a main home. So I think there is interest, and um, I think the the um, development of this of this amendment language is a response to that interest in detached ADUs. I just um, I don't, it's. It's hard to put a number or um, give you a, uh, a you know a, a yeah a number to the the positive or um, the positive interest in this type of building form. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments, Mr. Ramler Ramler Olson? Um, for myself, I am, I'm glad to see this moving forward when we had our joint meeting with the Planning Commission. Um, oftentimes we discuss things that we think are really good ideas and then that's as far as they go. And I'm really happy to see this moving forward because I think this is going to help with affordable housing. It's, we're trying to be creative and I think that's what was the goal. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, 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 pleased to uh, get your feedback and uh, thank you for allowing me to present this. Thank you. Item 6.2 Senior Community Services Home Program. Um, we have guests here tonight, so welcome. Uh, thank you for having me this evening. Uh, my name is John Burkow. I'm the Home Program Director at Senior Community Services. I'd like to thank uh, the City of Bloomington for your partnership over these many years. Uh, my goal here tonight is just to give a brief overview again of our services, provide some updates, uh, talk about our new technology service, and then answer any questions that you might have. <clears throat> so we've been, um, I think our time in the city date back, dates back to 1980. So we've been around for a while. Um, but we have several different programs here in the city. Um, you'll see on the first flyer there, the, our senior outreach program is basically our licensed social workers that help connect older adults to resources. Um, Bob Anderson is one of our social workers who works out of the Creekside uh, Community Center. And we also provide uh, help to caregivers along with that service. Uh, the nice thing about having social workers on staff is that we can refer our folks in the home program uh, when it's warranted. We had a call from one of our home clients and it was kind of a scattered message and we didn't know quite what was going on. So we reached out to this person's daughter and we found out that the person had had a fall and that the um, both daughters had been staying with that person, with their parent, their mother. And they were kind of at wit's end. They didn't know quite what they were going to do next. They were taking off time from work and trying to be with her because she had just experienced this medical uh, situation. 
And so we were able to refer them to talk to Bob, our social worker, and then he was able to go on and connect them to resources, rest, respite, and other resources. So it's really nice from uh, my viewpoint to have uh, those social workers available, and we can kind of work together uh, and work with city staff as well. Um, so the home program uh, is pretty self-explanatory, I think. Um, we're all about aging in place. You guys were just talking about that with the ADUs. Uh, I think it's great to have more housing options. What we try to do is help older adults um, stay in their homes by providing assistance with maintenance, um, lawn mowing, snow shoveling. Our minor repair program is really popular. Um, we do lots of different projects. We're actually um, pretty excited gearing up for a project here in Bloomington. We're gonna have a couple large volunteer groups come through, a couple of our paid staff, and we're gonna actually paint an entire home. So it's nice to see uh, kind of as COVID has taken a back seat, hopefully for a long time and for the future, but the volunteer groups are coming out more now, uh, so that's really great to see them um, engaging more. Um, another program we operate is Medicare, pa Medicare Partners, which is basically a way for people who are struggling with medical bills um, and they have maybe trouble affording their supplemental medical insurance, their Part B. They can go to a participating hospital and they'll accept Medicare's full payment. So it's really a great program. Again, our social workers uh, will work with people who fall in that kind of income range and get them connected. Uh, a lot of times medical bills, especially if they have a chronic condition, can become a really big deal. Obviously, even that 20%. So this is a great uh, program for those who qualify. Um, I shared a little uh, another flyer here about our home program. It just kind of goes into greater detail about everything. We are in Wright and Sherburne counties, so we're, we've expanded over the last three or four years. Uh, so that's going well. Um, our newest service is a technology support service. We're really excited about this one. Um, we're going to be starting probably in the next month or two here. Uh, we're going to work with Creekside uh, to have a volunteer there on a regular basis where people can come into the center, um, bring their devices, get one-on-one -on -one, uh, technical assistance. We're also going to be doing that in-home. Um, we got some funding through uh, Hennepin County, so we have a year grant to do this. We've actually been doing it already up in Wright and Sherburne County for the last uh, about two and a half, three years. So we have a model and we kind of know what we need to do. Um, but I think COVID showed all of us that uh, technology is something you can't really live without. Um, older adults were in no different situation where they were isolated and cut off. And I think we all realized that technology is almost becoming like a basic utility, right? It's like electricity or gas. It's hard to, hard to survive and thrive without it. Um, I think one of the reasons I, our minor repair program has become so popular because, you know, five, six, seven, whatever number of years ago, you used to pull out the yellow pages, right? You could search under plumbers and you could maybe find a plumber or talk to a friend. Well, now if you're not connected to the internet, I mean, if I need a plumber, I probably go to Nextdoor or some kind of, you know, site like that and try to get um, some information. But if you're not online, you know, how do you know where to turn to find repair people or other people that you need for the maintenance of your home? So we're really excited about this technology support. What we found is that what um, older adults typically want is one-on-one -on -one help. Uh, we did, we've done some iPad classes and other classes like that. There are some options for that, uh, you know, through the community and other things. But we, what we've really found is that that one-on-one -on -one, uh, help is what the older adults really like. Uh, the appointment either at a community setting or going into someone's home uh, as needed. So we're really excited about that. I know it's not a part of the HRA funding, but I wanted to share and talk about it, and you'll probably be hearing more about that going forward. So um, so yeah, kind of uh, things are going along well. Like I said, we're happy to have people re-engaging, more volunteer groups coming back. Um, we are part of um, Trusted Messengers in Hennepin County. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Trusted Messengers, but it's basically a group of several organizations that work with Hennepin County to kind of be ready if COVID resurges. Uh, we're gonna all kind of network together and coordinate our responses. So we're ready in case it, it comes back in the fall or there's a resurgence of it. But our main thing is to keep people safe, you know, and, and at home was the safest place to be. That's where most people wanna remain is in their home. They wanna age in place for as long as they can. And we're just uh, one partner in helping people do that. So again, thank you for your uh, partnership and support over these many years. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you for that update. That was really, really good information. Are there any questions or comments from the commissioners? 
Yes, Commissioner Hookey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my only question is, I know that you guys focus a lot with Creekside, but mm -hmm. what about the aging community that doesn't go to Creekside? Because there's quite a few that I know that don't really, I don't even know that some of them even know about Creekside. Mm -hmm. um, how, do, how do you guys reach them, or what can we do to help reach those people um, going forward? Well, in the past, we've um, put information like in the Bloomington briefing, which goes out to a much larger audience. Um, and we try to do e events. We're going to be attending the Pride event here in a couple of weeks. Uh, there's an older adult job fair, interestingly enough. Uh, some of those folks may uh, want to work or may need services. I don't know. But we try to attend some different events in the community. Um, we get a lot of referrals through something called the Senior Linkage Line, if you're familiar with them. But that's an information line that people call to get uh, connected to resources. And a lot of folks uh, just reach out to us. The city uh, staff actually will refer to us. Um, you know, if someone comes to their attention or someone's calling to look for help. Um, but we try to do outreach events. We're kind of looking forward to doing more back-in-person outreach events now that the pandemic has subsided. So that's always been our goal is to try to do different things. But you're right, you know, outside of Creekside. So. Thank you. Are there any other uh, yes, care? Commissioner Thorson? It occurred to me, and maybe I already said this, but in terms of outreach, do you ever uh, get a booth at the farmer's market? or? We did have a booth. There was an event uh, in conjunction with the farmer's market, and there was a number of organizations that was hosted right here in this building. It was maybe three or four years ago, but I haven't attended recently. Would you suggest that as a good place to... Okay. Okay. For sure. Are there any other questions or comments? Well, thank you again. I really appreciated the information. Chair yeah. Lewis? Uh, yes. Thank you, uh, Erica Coleman. I just wanted to add that uh, in the Bloomington briefing for the September edition, we will be um, including information about senior community services and their programs uh, coming out. Good news. Thank you. Thanks for bumping me up in the agenda. Not that I don't <laughs> want to stay, but uh, it's been a long day, so I appreciate that too. But have a good evening, everybody. Okay, thank you for coming. Um, now we will move back to organizational business, item 4.1, HRA board new commissioner appointment process. Um, I'll turn it over to... Yes, thank you, Chair Lewis, Erica Coleman. So um, I was bringing this back forward, uh, back to you, uh, because our last discussion that we had, we um, had a really good discussion about the appointment process and the approval of um, two new commissioners from the legislative um, legislation that was passed this past session at the state. And so... Um, we had discussed about staggered terms and the potential to um, have new commissioners be seated for less than five years. Upon further conversation with our uh, general counsel, the way the legislation is written for chapter uh, 469, which is the HRA statute, they are speaking in terms of one, two, three, four or five years when a new board is created only. So commissioners do need to be seated for five year terms. Um, so going forward, there is no recommended changes to the bylaws based on that because that would have been the only change, but that is not a change we can make. So um, there are a couple of things. I do have some information from coordinating with our Community Outreach and Engagement Division Liaison about the appointment process, the application process and appointment process, as well as there is, an, a, res, there is a resolution attached to the agenda item because this body does need to formally accept the legislation uh, before the city council accepts the legislation of adding two commissioners to increase the board from five to seven members. So uh, the first thing is in, in talking with um, our liaison, Emily Larson, uh, she did make a point to let me know that um, we would have these two seats and we do have one term expiring at the end of this year and the Port Authority has two seats at the end of this year. 
And so um, to do an open application process at the same time um, that we would have three seats, three openings to new seats that we would um, look to start the week of September 5th by meeting to launch a recruitment plan, including one to two um, commissioners, usually the chair and or vice chair uh, as a part of that recruitment plan and a part of the interview and appointment process. Um, So that would be September 5th. And then um, September 12th, begin promotion and open the applications up to the public. And doing so, we would include uh, key messages provided by the HRA board to highlight the current priorities or populations that we are encouraging to apply, right? Um, So really bringing you in and using the board to fully inform to grow the board and how we go through the appointment process. So the application period would be from September 12th to October 31st. And so then we would look at the week of October 31st, uh, packets, getting the packets to the interview committee. And then the liaison would coordinate with the applicants for interviews because we would hold interviews. Um, And then the week of the 31st through to the week of November 7th, we would have interviews. We would coordinate and have interviews, I'm sorry, from the 31st through the 14th of November. So two weeks total to schedule the interviews and hold the interviews with our staff liaison, which would give us enough time to have the interviews, have discussion, and provide a um, provide a memo to the mayor because the mayor does appoint with the approval of the city council. Um, so we provide a memo to the mayor, same process we did this past year and that um, it would go before the city council the 28th of November for new terms to begin January 1, 2023. So um, some of the things that we looked at are being able to have the interviews be 15, 20 minutes in duration, um, taking place virtually And then offering um, the interviews on a weekday evening and a Saturday to try and make sure we're meeting not only our commissioners' needs, but also the applicants as we're going through this process. Um, Each interview panelist must commit to participating in all the scheduled interviews. And then if the applicant's not available for the interview, then their application would be considered solely based on the information provided in the application. And then we would uh, work on drafting some of the uh, questions that we would like to have based on that information that we would like to formulate as a committee on what are the key things that we would like to make sure are remaining and growing for the HRA board. So with that, we can have a discussion, I can take any questions, and then you do have still a motion to accept the legislation for this, that increasing the board. Thank you, Administrator Cole. I will open it up to, open it up to the commissioners. Um, are there any questions or comments for Administrator Coleman? What are your thoughts? Um, uh, Chair Coleman? Lewis, I, I guess we would just comment the process sounds uh, very appropriate to me, and I think you... Uh, took our took our input and created a great process out of it. Are there any? Yes, uh, Commissioner Coulter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just say that I, having gone through the interview process with our board and commissions this past year, it, I mean, it was involved. It was not a small amount of time, um, but I think it resulted in it definitely resulted in a much better product um, in terms of our our appointees and and the information that the council had available to it. So. Um, I think we're heading in the right direction. Uh, Commissioner Hukim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, The only thing I would like to add, and this is going forward after this process, is, and I understand this is for this process, but just wanted to get it out there, is maybe doing um, some sort of mentorship with a current commissioner into with a new commissioner. Um, 
being one of the newer commissioners within the last couple of years, I think I was blessed enough to have John Olson like kind of take me under his wing and guide me. And I think that that's really important. And I think that if we open that up so that they have like a direct person they feel that they can contact or whatever um, with questions, concerns, I think if you have one person, it doesn't violate any, you know, any issues, um, legalities, but it just kind of allows them to ask questions maybe privately instead of having to do it publicly during the learning curve. So just something I wanted to throw out there, but I think this process is wonderful. Thank you very much for giving us a complete detailed outline and schedule that we can put on our calendars and we know what's gonna happen and we know what's gonna go forward and we have plenty of time then to get someone in, get new people in here in January. So thank you for that hard work. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Huhim. I just wanna add that um, I do think that's a great idea that I will take back to our Community Outreach and Engagement Division. And just to add, when I started, I was linked with a peer mentor. Um, so even in the city, it's already there for staff. And so just carrying that forward, as long as we're clear about um, the rules and quorum and different things like that, um, I think that's something that our Community Outreach and Engagement Division would be open to receiving that feedback. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was a very good suggestion. Um, is, there, is there any other any other questions or discussion? Um, because if not, I would be looking for a motion to approve resolution approving laws of Minnesota 2022, Chapter 60, Sections 1 and 2. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. I'm sorry. Was it Commissioner Coulter? Okay. Uh, it was uh, moved by Commissioner Coulter with a second by Commissioner Hukim to approve the resolution approving laws of Minnesota 2022, Chapter 60, Sections 1 and 2. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I uh, will now have the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion passes five to zero. Thank you. All right, we're now going back to um, discussion items. Item 6.3, West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust. Um, may we have the staff report? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Lewis, Erica Coleman. I'm uh, providing the report that came directly from Brenda Lano with Homes Within Reach, and this will be added to the agenda packet after this meeting, so that is accessible by the public to see the memo and the update. That came directly from Brenda Lano Wolke, who is the executive director of West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust, doing business as Homes Within Reach. Um, the only reason that she is not here is because they do also have a board meeting this evening at the same exact time. So in providing the update that was provided to me, uh, West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust 2021 activities in Bloomington, so better known as Walt, was able to acquire, rehab, and sell three properties in Bloomington in 2021, utilizing $225,000 of City of Bloomington funding. $75,000 was from 2019 award and $150,000 was from the 2020 award. This is the CDBG funding that you do approve every year for um, $75,000 per home for up to two homes a year. And so they were able to leverage an additional $381,910 in funding from Hennepin County, Met Council, and Minnesota Housing and first mortgages of their home buyers as an additional leverage of $570,000, bringing the investment into Bloomington to $1,161,910. Right? That's the, the initial investment of $225,000 brought into Bloomington, $1,161,910. So all three homes were estate homes. So this means the sellers welcome the opportunity to sell to the land trust program and see their homes rehabbed for the benefit of a hardworking family. The homes needed significant rehab. So this included windows, siding, roof, insulation, HVAC, lead removal, radon, and et cetera needs. So Walt performs an energy audit, a housing quality standards review, 
and lead-based paint study to guide them on rehab needs. Per their funding, they must address health, safety, and energy efficiency issues. That is a part of the CDBG requirements, and it may be a part of other funding requirements as well, but at least it's a part of CDBG. They utilize the energy audit to determine the HERS rating. So this is the environment. Her, I forget the home environment. I forget the actual, I'm so used to talking in acronyms. But it is the environment rating, the rating which states how energy efficient a home is. 100 being the standard of a new home. So the average rating on these homes prior to rehab was 126. After rehab, these homes averaged a HERS rating of 72. It's better than a new home. The annual energy saving for these families is $775. So it's sustainable. <laughs> on top of it. So one home had little to no wall insulation and they were able to partner with Center for Ener en Energy and Environment to use the home as a test home for a product called Aerosil. This innovative product is used in commercial setting but expansion into the single family setting is new. One home buyer is tracking his energy costs to truly evaluate the energy savings from tightly sealing the home. And then lastly, just to give you an idea of who purchased these homes, the three homes, the first one was a single father, two children, works in a neighboring community. The second one was a traditional family, two children, and had been renting in Bloomington. And the third was a traditional family, four children, working in Bloomington. So I can stand for any questions. <laughs> Are there any questions for Administrator Coleman or comments? I mean, it was that was the wonderful report. So good to hear. All right. Well, hearing none, um, we will move on to um, the HRA updates. Thank you. So I had quite a few updates, and they didn't call for their own individual agenda items, but I wanted to give you um, information on things that are happening uh, that you have um, involvement in. So the first one is 600 West 93rd. Um, this is the state bond request. As you'll recall, this is for a, a senior affordable housing complex, and they just went to city council on July 18th as a uh, amending the resolution for preliminary approval to the issuance of the conduit revenue obligation bond. So this is low income housing tax credit that they are applying for. And because it's with the state, it is the city council's role to approve for the application that they will bond. So this was just amending it. They actually needed to increase the amount um, by a little bit that they are applying for. And the city council voted in favor, so they adopted the resolution, and that application has been submitted, so we are just waiting to hear if they've been approved for the project to move forward with low-income housing tax credits. 8200 Humboldt Avenue South had a groundbreaking event on July 14th. As you recall, this is an office building that is being um, removed for an affordable housing development uh, that will include 50% uh, area median income units that you did uh, review and approve this project previously. I drove by this morning. The building was still there, but I know it's coming down soon. <laughs> <laughs> 8012 Old Cedar Redevelopment, as you can recall, this was um, actually a really a great development that includes 30% area median income units. There is one three-bedroom 30% unit in that development. Um, they uh, are calling this Cadence, and Cadence is the construction was substantially completed as of July 7th, 2022 from their investor uh, update report. I do want to add that um, this is really a good project that we um, ended up providing updates and modifications to the Opportunity Housing Ordinance to allow for a higher density uh, bonus and other uh, parking excuse me, parking incentives that allowed for this property to be able to be built and provide those 30% units that it is providing. I have, um, it is in the leasing process with move-in scheduled also according to their update. 
And I have reached out to the developer just to see about us having um, some type of tour with the board and staff to view that. So I will let you know when I hear back. Um, uh, in terms of our Housing Choice Voucher Program, so we have an annual administrative plan. Um, we call it the administrative plan and the agency plan. There's uh, Those things have to be done on an annual basis. And so right now we have... Um, updated the plan just to make sure it includes like our HUD VASH and our FYI vouchers um, and our waiting list requirements. And it is open for public comment period currently. It's on our webpage. It is also in the HRA office and it can be um, viewed by anyone Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, we are accepting comments uh, written by email as well as um, in writing by mail, and then we will have a um, public hearing later at towards the closer to the end of the public comment period. Um, we also sent letters for our resident advisory board. So this is actually a requirement that we have where we send the letters to all of our participants, um, asking them if they are interested in participating in the resident advisory board for this program. Um, we have provided information for them to respond either by mail or by email. Um, and we do have a closing uh, deadline date for that uh, to get the participants. According to our uh, regulations, if we don't get enough response, we do appoint all of our um, participants, which is over 500 people, to the Resident Advisory Board. And that's just following HUD regulations for the program. But I want to make you aware. <laughs> um, City-owned land for potential redevelopment. Uh, I will be... Um, going to the city council to um, look at some city owned land for potential redevelopment um, that would include options for affordable home ownership opportunities. And at this point, um, it is in the ordinance in the charter for the city that we either do a open bid process or the city council by majority, um, at least five have to vote for an alternative process. Um, and since um, we're looking at different ways of encouraging and increasing affordable homeownership opportunities, we'll be taking that forward to the city council to ask about that. And then our Just Deeds community event. I actually have a flyer, um, but it will be, we can add it as well. But currently, this is being advertised at blm.mn forward slash Just deeds. This community event will take place on Wednesday, August 10th from 6 to 8 p.m. at Bryant Park. That's 1001 West 85th Street. What it is is that it'll be an opportunity to connect with neighbors and learn more at a community event featuring food, speakers, discussion circles, and more. People are encouraged to bring their outdoor chairs or picnic blankets. What Just Deeds is, is that the city of Bloomington is a participant. As you know, the HRA did discharge the racially restricted covenant language that was on one of our HRA-owned properties. And um, what it is, is that in that coalition, we assist property owners with discharging discriminatory covenants from their property deeds. A few facts is that Bloomington, over 500 properties in Bloomington have discriminatory covenants on them. The discriminatory covenants were once used to keep people of color from buying houses. And acknowledging this and other forms of discrimination helps build a foundation for more inclusive communities. And so the purpose of this community event is just learning, gathering, um, sharing in community. Um, so I will be at that event um, participating. It is open to all of our commissioners, obviously. It's open to the public. Um, and then lastly, uh, what's not on here, but super exciting, because it's just a few days from the Just Deeds event, is our August 13th is the Pride event. Pride event is here in Bloomington um, at Civic Plaza, and that will be taking place on August 13th, uh, which I encourage commissioners and in the public to join in and participate in that event. And those are all my updates for now. Thank you um, for that lot of good stuff in there. 
Um, this, sure, Liz? Uh, yes. Just a quick question. Thorson? I might have asked it last time, but I don't remember the answer. How does one find out if they have restrictive covenants on their property? Good question. Thank you for that question, uh, Commissioner Thorson. So I know that you can visit the City of Bloomington webpage, which also can take you to the map where you can look up your address in particular. And I do want to say that um, the reason this park was chosen, um, let me back up. Our planning manager planning division and our community outreach and engagement division are leading this. This is not the HRA leading this. So I have to make sure I'm clear on that. They are leading this. They are a part of the just deeds coalition uh, as representing as the city of Bloomington. But one of the really neat things that is available on our webpage is a map where you can put your address in and see if there is a racially restricted covenant or a restrictive covenant on your property. But this park was chosen because it's surrounded by properties that do have restricted covenants on them currently. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I noticed we have two people in the audience this evening. I'm not. Were you here for a particular reason or just for the meeting? Um, we're just here to listen. All right. Well, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, well, we are now ready for adjournment um one last madam thing. chair i am is it okay if i ask one question well that we usually have our comment section here so this is perfect <laughs> opportunity um as you're bringing up the pride event i am wondering does the hra have a booth that they're planning to have at event at the event thank you for the question so the hra has uh been offered and i am looking at um us having a booth there and who can staff it I would like to follow that up with, I would be more than happy to volunteer for a period of time as we do plan to attend as a family. So Great. I'd be more than happy to to show up and honor, or represent the HRA for a period of Great. time. Great. Then we have a booth. <laughs> <laughs> and I can fill in when she leaves. So. <laughs> and I will be there as well. Okay. Three people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, now, do I hear a motion for adjournment? Not quite. No, wait. Oh, this thing. one more thing. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Before we adjourn, I just want to remind that our next meeting is not until the end of August, the fourth Tuesday in August, because August 9th, the second Tuesday in August where we would normally have a meeting is primary election. So we do want everybody to participate and pay attention and vote in the primary election. Um, but we will not be having any meetings uh, for state law. You cannot have any public meetings on those evenings. So our next meeting won't be until the end of August. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Now do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Hukim with a second by Commissioner Thorson that we adjourn the July 26, 2022 HRA board meeting. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Um, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>